Hello and welcome back to the Pharmaverse podcast. I'm your host, Michael Petrak. And if you're a leader or an aspiring leader in the pharmaceutical industry, well, then you're in the right place because we interview the best and the brightest stars from all the corners of the pharma universe. The Pharmaverse podcast is brought to you by K. Bassman International, your complete resource for life sciences recruiting. We're also sponsored by Executive Biotech Advisors, a premier consulting agency in the pharma and biotech arena. We're joined by Margaret Yu, MD, who is the Chief Medical Officer at ArtBio. ArtBio is an oncology company advancing cancer care with alpha radioligand therapy. And we're going to be diving into how to disrupt an entire industry, her management philosophy, and the novel things going on at ArtBio. So, Margaret Yu, welcome to the Pharmaverse. Hi, Michael. It's nice to be here. And I think where we should start is this radio ligand space is just all the buzz in pharma. And the last time we spoke, you really educated me about the radio ligand space, how they're created and so on. You gave me a masterclass. But can you give sort of a brief overview of how these therapies are even developed? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, These radio ligand therapies have actually been around for a very long time uh, because if you think about it, we've been using radiation therapy not only to take pictures of patients, right, to to diagnose different kinds of conditions. We've used uh, radiation therapy to treat patients in lieu of surgery. Um, So uh, we have lots of ways of um, ablating tumors with radiation therapy. Um, you know, we didn't really have ways of using uh, radiation as a drug until very recently when uh, we realized we could basically link a radioisotope to a targeted delivery molecule. Got it. So, okay. Yeah. So when you say that it's been around a long time, t- uh, talk to me about the origins and then and then after that, let's talk about the evolution of where it is today. But you were telling me something really interesting. It's like, what, over 100 years old or something? Yeah, so, so radiation x-rays. Um, so in German, I think it's, it's Röntgen. I don't think I'm saying it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's named after a physician who actually uh, discovered that you can use x-rays to take pictures of patients to diagnose them. And that was like 130 years ago. Okay. And that was around the same time that Marie and Pierre Curie uh, isolated radioactive radium from uranium cores. Um, and, and these are basically nuclear waste that you can find um, in the ground. They're naturally occurring mm. and you can extract them. Uh, at the time, I think it was just thought that x-rays were used to uh, be a diagnostic. But then very soon after that, um, the Curies realized that you can use uh, radiation to treat cancer. And so this is 130 years in the <laughs> making. That's really incredible. Like I would have never known that, but it does make a lot of sense once you tell it to me. And, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about radio ligand therapy, but may not know exactly how it works. I really appreciated how you talked about how it attaches to something. And that's really what, what uh, you're imaging in, in the, at the end game. And it reminds me of antibody drug conjugates, how there's an attachment there. How are those therapies different? Yeah, that great question. Um, to me, conceptually, they're similar. Because instead of a toxin or a poison that you're linking to a targeting delivery vehicle, you're now linking to a radioisotope with a radio ligand. Uh, so, you know, more of this getting more precision in the treatment um, now that we have better and better technology. I've been reading a lot about Art Bio and about some of the big announcements. There was a Series B closing that you guys had, some new imaging clinical data. Tell us what you can about how these big milestones and what they mean to the company. Yeah, so, you know, the company's only three years old. So uh, a lot of the the work, I think, was done primarily in the last two years. It's really a lot of progress in a short period of time. Um, If you think about 
you know, going back to when radiation was even thought to be useful in medicine, that was 130 years ago. So the first and only alpha isotope that is approved for treatment of patients is radium-223. It's branded as Zofigo. Uh, that was approved in 2019. And the first in human study was done in 2000. So it took 19 years for that drug to get approved. So, in, so to think that, you know, ArtBio is now talking about, you know, starting its first company-sponsored study and it created the, uh, the drug and the radioisotope to be able to supply the, the, the clinical trials that are planned, that's a very short period of time. That is. Now that you put it into perspective like that, uh, it's it's short for any drug development cycle. But uh, in this particular case, it's really uh, right at the beginning. And we're all excited about Art Bio. So some of the people that are listening are leaders in big pharma, that that's all they've known, you know, um, and they're considering going to small biotech. And what advice would you give to them just mindset wise about if they're going to make that transition? I think making a transition, you have to be comfortable with risks. Um, I mean, we deal with risks every day in R and D, but it's a different kind of risk. It's a, it, it's a, um, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of what um, you think about and you contribute to in a small company. Uh, there is no redundancy, so you're it. And you have to be comfortable with that. And you have to like to solve problems and realize that oftentimes you might be the only expert. Um, you know, you have consultants, of course, that you can always reach out to. But, you know, ultimately you're responsible. You've got to be okay with owning that. Let's dive more into your career because it's really interesting. I like to ask leaders where in their life did their leadership journey begin? Some people like felt like they were a leader right from the very beginning. Some people, it happens later in life. When did the leadership journey start for you? It's mm, a great question, Michael. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I think when you're trained in medical school, you're trained to be the leader of the team because um, you have to make some decisions for patients who come to you, who depend on you, they rely on you. Um, what, what's different when I joined, um, you know, the company side is that, um, you know, really doing science is, is really a team sport. Um, it, it's not, you really don't have the kind of impact that you can have when you have one or two people involved. Um, the best teams um, can make a drug that's mediocre look great. And... And I, I don't think in medical school we're taught to really be able to do team sport. That happens later. That happens when you're, maybe you're part of a project um, when you're in residency, you're part of a project when you're in fellowship, um, or you're part of a research project that you yourself um, are placed into. You really don't learn that until, until you get to that point. And I will say, like, I started at a point um, of my career when team sports was not as common. So, um, so, so I would say most of my leadership growth probably came after I joined the industry side. I was in academia for about four and a half years after I completed my fellowship. Makes sense. And, and you had sort of an unorthodox mentor, right? A really kind of tough love mentor. Tell us about that individual. Yeah, my 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 mentor was the head of uh, hematology at the time, and he has a photographic memory, and so he would quiz you until you didn't know something, which was which didn't take very long for most of us. <laughs> so you felt pretty small when you were around him, um, but I I really learned a ton. Um, because he he put me in very uncomfortable positions much of the time. And I think that was the beginning of when I realized we have a lot to do in medicine. Um, you know, what we have for standard of care is just the beginning, um, especially in oncology. More about your career. You were telling me last time about a very special patient that you met in residency 
that really reshaped your whole career. Can you tell us about that person? Yeah. Yeah. It was actually in medical school, Michael. Oh, medical um, school. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay. I, I was trying to, so I'm, I'm somebody who likes to solve problems, right? That's, I don't know. I like to do puzzles or something. That's great. And <laughs> so, so, you, you know, um, what, what's nice about puzzles is that you have a problem and there's a beginning and there's an end and you're done. Right. And so I was drawn to disciplines where there's a problem and there's a fix like surgery. You know, there's something I need to fix and I can like do the surgery and be done. And then uh, during one of my rotations in medical school, um, I had a patient in the surgery rotation who had an isolated liver metastasis uh, from her colon cancer. And she had been admitted to the hospital to get cryotherapy, which at the time was still very popular, where you kind of freeze isolated uh, liver lesions with this approach. I got to know her very well. Um, you know, she, she had the procedure, went home, and then she came back in like 10 days with recurrent disease. Um, her disease had grown, uh, even though the procedure was successful. Um, it had progressed to the point that uh, she couldn't stay home anymore. She was home for 10 days, and she said what was really touching was what she said to me uh, when she was admitted that second time. She said, you know, I, I had the best days of my life uh, in the last few years because um, it was the first time I could taste my food in as long as I can remember. And I had like this best dinner with my husband and I wouldn't trade that for anything. Um, that made me realize that my, my calling is not surgery. I'm going to go into medicine. That's really cool that you found your calling and, and now you're helping endless number of patients potentially with every new thing that, that is being developed. And, um, I'm so glad there's people like you doing what you're doing, you know, uh, because cancer is something that touches all of us at some point, some way. It's very encouraging to know that that you're out there doing this. And But you did say something interesting last time we spoke that uh, I just wanted to elaborate on because I've been thinking a lot about it since. And you said, you know, I'm not really a science brain, Michael. I'm a language brain. I was like, I think I get what you mean, but can you explain that? I understand data in a uh, linguistic way, okay. meaning meaning when I, when I see what, when I, when I see the results of an experiment, I have to put it into some kind of context uh, so that I understand how it's relevant to me or to what I'm doing. If I were more of a science brain, I would just want to know the result for the sake of knowing. Wow, look, my cells know when to go to the left side versus the right side. Well, I don't care. Is that important for metastatic disease? Um, and I was never the kid who was thinking about, well, how do, I, how do I build the microscope so I can see the cells on the slide? So I was never the, you know, the science engineering brain. I was more the, why does this cell look this way? And this other cell, there are some of, the, some of these little arms and legs. So, so that's what I mean by, um, I'm kind of a language brain. I'm not a mathematical engineering science brain. <laughs> Uh, you know, I kind of resonate with that because I, I have a master's in English. And so the whole reason I went and got an English degree and so on was because I wanted to go as far away from math and science as possible. And now I work in, in a scientific field. And for me, the scientific terms don't have a scientific context for me all the time. It's, but I understand what the word means. So I can use the word, but I can't, I can't see it scientifically. Is that sort of, I'm not saying that's you, but is that sort of more of a language brain too? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm more like that than, well, did you mean picamolar or did you mean 10 picamolar or did you mean a hundred picamolar? I mean, for someone who's more sciencey, they might be very interested in the 
quantitative aspects of the number versus you're probably just going, was that a lot or not so much? How does having that orientation impact your leadership style? Because I got to think a lot of the people that you manage are the science brain types. Maybe that's not true. I, I, well, I, I do think a lot of people go into science because they're, they're sciencey people, mm -hmm. mathematical engineering people. I, I think, um, what happens is that we bring different perspectives to the table. So I, I don't see things like my colleagues oftentimes, um, whether that's just me or it's because I'm kind of a language brain, you know, mm -hmm. science, scientific, uh, type of career. I, I don't know. Um, but it, it, I think it, it brings different perspectives and maybe it means that um, we will end up with better drugs in development. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can tell, like from all of our conversations, you're so well at explaining things. And, I, and, and you do have an emphasis on language. Like even when you were talking about the alpha versus the beta you know, you're, you're, you're using the language to tell the story. And I think as CMO, I got to think a big part of your day is telling the scientific story to people who aren't necessarily scientists. Has that benefited you? Um, well, um, I, I'm me, so I, I, I don't know <laughs> of any other way of explaining things, Michael, but, um, I, I, I have spoken to more non- uh, science people since joining as a CMO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was an, an area that I didn't have as much experience in before I joined the startup. Um, so so I think that is true. Um, I, I think um, I am hoping that when I explain things, it's a little clearer to someone who maybe is not as deep into the science or maybe hasn't been thinking it through as uh, as deeply. Um, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to understand it in a way that I can explain it to my daughter. Yeah. Um, so. And you were you telling me she's a language it. brain too, right? She, <laughs> she is a language brain too, who wants to do science. So oh my goodness. I don't know if I have any impact on that, but it's, it's, it's quite funny because, uh, she tries really hard in her science classes and she doesn't quite do as well as her language classes, which is kind of I'll see you something too. <laughs> well, the apple didn't fall far from the tree there. I have yeah. one more question for you. And it's a question I ask a lot of the people that are on this show. And it's about leadership advice because this is a leadership podcast. But it's more about what would you tell yourself when you were in your first leadership position? What bit of advice would you tell yourself that you know now? Because a lot of the people listening are in their first leadership role. I think the most important thing is to remember that when things are hard and when things feel um, tough, that's when you learn the very most. And it's really important to stay resilient. And when you look back on it, those are really the experiences that you treasure because that's what helps you grow. Um, you, you come out so much, so much better. Don't, don't just resign that this is something that's that you can't fix. Maybe there's no solution today. You know, go take a walk, go and do something different, come back to it. Um, there's always a way. Yeah, that that's great advice. I could I could definitely use that advice at times because I try to fix whatever's going on right away. It's the biggest emergency that there is. And sometimes you do have to step away to see the solution. Well, sadly, Margaret, that's all the time we have for the episode, but it's been so nice to speak with you again. Every time is, is a great time, but I can tell you that everyone listening in the Pharmaverse is going to glean a lot from this. We learned so much about radio ligand therapies and, uh, and also a lot about you. So thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you for the opportunity and for the invitation, Michael. It's been fun. That wraps up another episode of the Pharmaverse podcast. We have many more incredible leaders lined up for you. So make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a single insight. That's a wrap. See you next time on the Pharmaverse. <laughs>